is Professor Gerald H. Fridman. Uh, Frid Professor Fridman was educated at Oxford University. Uh, he's a member of the English Bar, the South Australian Bar, the Bar of Alberta, and the Ontario Bar. He has taught law at the University of Adelaide, the University College London, uh, Alberta, where he was the Dean of the Faculty from 1970 to 1975, and the University of Western Ontario. He's a prolific author of books on agency, sale of goods, tort cases, and others. He's the author of many essays in journals, Canadian Bar Review, Quarterly Review, Modern Law Review, McGill Law Journal, and on and on. And I'm sure those of you who maintain an active interest in the practice of law will know him well. Professor Frith. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for that introduction. Like the other speakers, I have prepared a paper which will ultimately be published in the volume of these lectures. But I do not propose to read that for a number of reasons. First of all, it's very long and would occupy the time, much, uh, much more time than I have. Secondly, to read a paper is very uninteresting for the lecturer and excessively boring for the audience. So what I propose to do is to give you the gist of the paper in the ensuing three quarters of an hour. Are you sure you can't hear me? Because I hate my. Can you hear? They can't hear me? Oh, yeah. All right, here we are. Oh, well. mm. Very good, thank you. Now, as uh, Professor uh, McCamus said, a lot has been happening in the law of torts in recent years. And one of the areas in which this has been happening is unquestionably the law of vicarious liability. What I want to do this morning is to talk about four particular topics where I think there has been some recent discussion and innovation, or potential innovation. First, the nature of the relationships that attract such liability. Secondly, the circumstances when such liability may arise. Thirdly, the question whether vicarious liability is really vicarious. And lastly, the problem of the exemption from liability of the one for whose acts the liability is imposed. Let us begin then by talking about the uh, persons in respect of whom vicarious liability may arise. Now, uh, you are all, I'm sure, familiar with the classical distinction between the contract of service and the contract for services and the uh, idea that an agent or a servant, on the one hand, may operate under a contract of service of some kind or another, whereas the independent contractor uh, operates under a contract for the provision of services. And the difference is that the, uh, there may be vicarious liability for the conduct of the agent or servant who works under a contract of service, but not or in general terms, not for the acts of an independent contractor who merely pro contracts to provide his services and does not render the employer, uh, generally speaking, liable for what he does. It seems that there is still much reference to this uh, idea in the case law. A and a recent example in the courts of Ontario is the uh, rather gruesome case, the facts are gruesome, of Fenn and the city of Peterborough, in which uh, one issue was whether the uh, municipality were liable for the acts of the uh, PUC in Peterborough, which resulted in a terrible accident causing uh, uh, dire injuries to various people. What emerges from the judgment in the Ontario Court of Appeal in that case is a very clear distinction between the possible liability of uh, the principal in tort for the acts of the agent uh, and the possible liability in contract. Uh, and there is uh, considerable discussion of the question 
whether when they delegated a task, when the municipality delegated a task to the uh, PUC, uh, the, the latter became the agent of the former so as to make the former liable. And in the result, it was held that there was such vicarious liability uh, because there was the necessary relationship. Um, there's also a question as to the personal liability of the agent, uh, which I don't think need concern us for the moment. Now, although there is retention of this idea of the distinction between service and services, there is considerable discussion as to what is the basis of that distinction. We know that over the years there have been many criteria suggested for drawing the distinction, criteria such as the mode of creation of the relationship, payment, duration, extension of, uh, of the term of the, of the relationship, who may discharge the employee, and so on. Essentially, however, when you boil down all that's, that's uh, raised, the impression is given in, in expressed language and by implication that the classical test is one of control. Who controls whom? Is there sufficient control to justify the imposition of this vicarious liability. Now, in the earliest days of vicarious liability, when the concept first began to emerge in the common law, uh, 17th and early 18th centuries, the kind of people for whom one might be responsible were really very minor sort of servants, people who did uh, what now is called colloquially menial service, although uh, menial, as the English Court of Appeal pointed out some 20 years ago, had a rather technical meaning. It meant, in fact, work that was done intra moinas within the walls of the household. But, but what's come to mean anything that is uh, rather humble and even demeaning. In those days, when servants did that sort of work, the idea of control was a very realistic one. You could, in fact, quite easily uh, regulate what your uh, butler or your uh, agricultural laborer or whatever, your coachman, was doing. In the 19th century, and certainly in the 20th century, society is a little more sophisticated. And a lot of people who are, in the eyes of the law, servants or agents subject to control, in realistic terms, cannot really be controlled. Uh, there is a famous uh, dictum of, I think, Lord Simon, uh, the Lord Chancellor in the 40s, to the effect that the captain of the ship, uh, when told what to do, will provide the sturdy answer. In other words, that although theoretically the captain of the ship may be the servant of the ship owners, there is really no way in which they can tell him what to do in any specific terms. And there are many other examples today of people who clearly cannot be told what to do or how to do it, and yet are theoretically under the control of their employers. Since it is clearly unrealistic to talk about control in these situations, Another idea has been put, put forward, uh, an idea which was recently uh, adopted uh, and uh, utilized by Mr. Justice Linden in a case called uh, Kennedy and CNA Assurance Company. Now, Mr. Justice Linden, as everybody knows, is always a few steps ahead of everybody else in his ideas, uh, which often leaves him out on a limb, as I think happened recently in the Brown case when he he gave a rather extraordinary judgment on the subject of punitive damages in the law of contract, but that's another story. <laughs> anyway, in the, uh, in the Kennedy case, uh, his lordship referred to this uh, notion, uh, and there is a certain element of validity about the whole idea. In other words, instead of talking about, and, and here I'm really summarizing the, 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 point, the, the whole point, instead of talking about whether somebody controls someone else, theoretically or realistically, one should see whether 
the person whose act is involved, the person whose act sets off potential liability, is a part of some group or organization which has undertaken responsibility with regard to the plaintiff. And as long as the person whose acts are in question and the acts themselves come within the scope of that broad-based obligation, then you do not need to worry about such matters as control, or whether there is a contract of service or services and so on. Now, this has a, a certain charm, if you like, a certain uh, structural attraction. And, uh, as I think will emerge later, it does possibly tie in with another view, which we'll have to look at, uh, as to the true nature of vicarious liability. However, uh, while it may be useful, I think it's only honest to admit that, by and large, uh, the courts do not appear to be adopting this view. They appear to be carrying on the more traditional notion, uh, the more traditional approach, uh, and uh, looking at the question, well, is this man a servant or agent? In other words, is there the requisite degree of control that entitles us to come to that conclusion? And yet, I have great sympathy with the point of view, and I, I uh, think, uh, as I think Mr. Justice Linden does, that if you apply it, it may be easy, uh, or become easier, to resolve certain issues. And uh, in the paper, I discuss uh, an English case back in the 1970s, a case called Riddick and Thames Board Mills, a somewhat complicated case about libel involving the publication of a report by one or two employees of a company vis-a-vis -vis another employee of a company, the report going to other people inside the company structure. And uh, some difficult problems arose with regard to vicarious liability and libel, uh, which I think might well have been solved or would have led to much greater unanimity on the part of the, of the court and less of what I call turgibizations, uh, fiddling around with the law in order to come up to a, some solution by simply saying everything was done within the confines of the particular organization. Nothing came outside the organization, therefore there couldn't possibly be any publication of a libel and there could be no vicarious liability. Well, uh, I think there could be other examples given of the way in which this sort of test might be useful and might preclude many of the problems that have tantalized the courts. Secondly, there is the question of the kind of acts for which the, uh, the master or principal will be liable. Traditionally, if you go back to the 19th century and before, the courts differentiated what was the scope of an agent's authority from what was the course of a servant's employment. And the question which they asked themselves in any given instance, if it was a case of principal and agent, was, did the agent act within the scope of his authority, whatever that authority may be? And that's a somewhat complex uh, notion. If the case involved a servant as opposed to an agent, the question was, did the servant do the act in the course of what he was employed to do, or was he engaged uh, on something uh, outside that employment. And in the 19th century, in the, certainly in the context of servants as opposed to agents, the courts drew a distinction between some deviation from what the servant was employed to do, a deviation that was nonetheless connected with that employment, a detour as it became called, and an act which was totally unconnected with the employment something that was quite distinct from the employment, although the employment, in, in a way, gave the servant the opportunity to per perpetrate the act. And this was a frolic. The uh, coachman uh, who was asked to deliver a parcel to point B and on the way perhaps went to another road to see his girlfriend ending up at point B to collect the parcel might be engaged in a detour. The coachman who decided to take his girlfriend for a ride in the country was definitely on a frolic. 
and this would have uh, different consequences as regards the uh, employer's liability should the coachman have been negligent and injured someone. Now, in 1912, in the famous case of Lloyd and Grace Smith and Company, the House of Lords uh, made a decision which had a tremendous impact upon this whole area. In the first place, they held that, contrary to some earlier opinions which had been expressed in the 19th century, the fact that the servant or agent was acting for his own benefit to advantage himself did not necessarily take what he was doing outside the scope of his authority if it was an agent or the course of his employment if he was a servant. It was not a frolic. It might have been a detour, but it was not a frolic. So that the fraudulent servant or agent who was uh, intending to benefit his own pocket by the way he acted with respect to the clients or customers of the employer could make the employer liable, as indeed did the fraudulent solicitor's clerk in that case. Secondly, the language of their lordships assimilated scope of authority and course of employment. In other words, from 1912 onwards, it has become clear that so far as vicarious liability in the law of torts is concerned, although the situation may be different where you're dealing with contracts, but so far as torts is concerned, it doesn't matter whether the perpetrator of the wrongful act was the agent or the servant of the defendant who is being sought to be made liable. Now this, I think, was a very important decision, and it has, it has had uh, vital consequences in the law. It is now too late, I think, to attempt to disrupt this development, to, to put the clock back and say agents are different from servants in tort as well as in contract. Uh, indeed, we have in this regard, I think, adopted the view which uh, emanated, I think, from Mr. Justice Holmes in the United States, where he, in fact, attempted to assimilate agency and ser uh, service, agents and servants, uh, in this way. Uh, and while there might have been a distinction in England in the 19th century, it is clear now that there isn't, so far as the law of torts is concerned, and in this way we have somewhat adopted American views, even though, from my reading of some recent uh, articles, there are suggestions in the United States that maybe the Americans are beginning to reject those views. Uh, that's always the way, of course, but anyway, it is clear that nowadays you do not need to worry whether what you're talking about is an agent or a servant. But you do need to worry, of course, about whether what is being done is within either the scope of the authority, if it's an agent you're talking about, or the course of the employment. And in this regard, one has to investigate whether what is being done has been expressly authorized or commanded or instructed by the employer, or impliedly so, or ha he has been held out as appearing to have authority or instruction or command to do this, or whether it's totally outside what he was uh, supposed to be doing. Now, there is a recent decision of the Privy Council, which is of great importance in this regard, a case called Kuragang Investments Proprietary Limited and Richardson and Wrench, reported in 1981, Three All England Reports, page 65 which raises the very important practical question in modern times of the moonlighting employee, uh, someone with whom I think uh, most people would now be familiar. Now the moonlighting employee is one who is regularly engaged by employer X, but on a particular occasion is working for employer Y or maybe even for himself. Now it's, it's important to differentiate the case where the employee employed by employer X is being lent to employer Y, that is not a case of moonlighting. That is a, a, a simple case of whether at the material time you regard the employee as the servant or agent of Y or of X. And there are many cases on this and, and many indications of how you resolve the issue. The Kuragang Investments case is concerned with the man who regularly acted as a value for one firm, but on one occasion acted as a value for another firm with which he was 
connected as, I think, a director uh, in, outside his ordinary office hours. And he performed some valuations for the plaintiffs, which turned out to be made negligently with the result that they lost a lot of money in, uh, on the loans they made. And they wished to sue the valuer's employers. In the event, it was held that the employers were not liable because the employee, the negligent valuer, had not been acting as their employee at the time, even though it was the kind of work that he was normally employed to do, namely value property. He was not fulfilling their instructions. He had, in fact, been told not to work. They'd all been told not to work for this company, these opponents, because uh, the uh, company had failed to pay some bills for the employers in the past. So there was a, a kind of prohibition against working in this way. Now, it was argued for the appellants that since the valuer was valuing, which is what he's employed to do, and since he was using the note paper and time of the employer, even though it was for his own purposes, his own outside purposes, that therefore the employer should be liable. There was no way, no reason why the plaintiff should know that the valuer was acting for someone else at the time rather than his actual employers. But in fact, the Privy Council said, this would create a very strict liability indeed if you took the view that as long as a man was doing the kind of thing which he was normally employed to do, whether it was what he was instructed to do for a client for whom he was instructed to do it, in the time of his employers or outside, and so on. If you took the view that as long as he was doing what he was normally employed to do, that would make his employer automatically liable, subject to some possible offenses, which are not discussed. This would create a strict liability of a quite extraordinary kind. And although, as Lord uh, Diplock, Lord Wilberforce, I'm sorry, Lord Wilberforce pointed out in a very uh, lucid and, and well written judgment. Although the law of vicarious liability has uh, changed considerably uh, in modern times and has progressed to create fairly wide liability, uh, there is no way that it could be regarded as so wide as to create that kind of liability. Uh, and uh, their lordships in the Privy Council were certainly not going to take the view that one must broaden liability and make it so strict. The, the common law has had to recognize the movement which has taken place from a relationship akin to that of slavery, in which all actions of the servant were dictated by the master, to one in which the servant claimed and was given some liberty of action. And uh, it is common knowledge that there is this kind of outside activity, but uh, this should not mean that whatever he does should involve the master in liability. Uh, now, notice that in that case, the Privy Council were not talking about the holding out of someone as having authority. They were talking about a case of actual or express authority to do something. And though he was employed to do the kind of things that were involved, he was not employed to do them vis-a-vis -vis these people at this particular time. So they would not infer from that that, therefore, the employers were liable for the consequences of what he, what he did. Notice also that, in that case, the employee, the negligent valuer, had been prohibited from working for the particular client in question because of the failure of that client in the past to pay off the, his bills. And it's clear from a reading of the opinion of Lord Wilberforce that this prohibition had a, a considerable effect upon the uh, question of liability, vicarious liability. In other words, the suggestion is that if the employee is prohibited from doing what he has done, in respect of which the potential liability arises, that prohibition may cause the act in question to be outside the scope of his authority or not within the course of his employment. And yet, 
The courts are inconsistent on this. If you go back to the famous case of Olympus and the London General Omnibus Company in the 1860s, where the uh, bus driver in the days of horse-drawn buses was specifically prohibited from racing with other rival companies and did so notwithstanding the prohibition, causing an accident. It was held that the omnibus company for whom he worked were liable vicariously even though they had said to him, don't do it, and even though there was nothing more they could have done to have prohibited it. Yet here is the Privy Council some years later, 100 years later, in the Kuragon case, seemingly suggesting that a prohibition can have the effect of making what is done not uh, something for which there can be vicarious liability. Now, if you contrast that with the slightly earlier Court of Appeal case of Rose and Plenty in 1976, 1 All England Reports, page 97, the situation becomes very complex. In that case, uh, a milkman goes on his rounds with a, a, a sort of float, and he's specifically instructed not to give lifts to anybody, not take anybody on the float, and not to employ anybody to help him. Notwithstanding that, he employs some uh, uh, child, 12, 13, 14-year-old, who rides around on the float and helps him with his rounds. And one day, by reason of the milkman's negligence, the boy is injured. And he sues the uh, milkman's employers, and they say, but uh, he was expressly prohibited from doing this, and therefore what he did was not within the course of his employment or within the scope of his authority, so there cannot possibly be any liability. The Court of Appeal, by a majority, hold that the defendants are liable, notwithstanding the uh, prohibition. Uh, Lord, Just Lord Justice Garman and Lord Denning uh, were with the majority, and Lord Justice Lawton dissented. And if you read the case, you'll find that while Lord Denning is largely concerned with uh, resolving some problems from some earlier Court of Appeal cases dealing with the giving of lifts when uh, the employee was prohibited from giving lifts, and the question whether that made the, the, the one given the lift a trespasser or not, Lord Justice Garman was anxious to dissociate the question of vicarious liability from the question of agency. Uh, and uh, at one point he says, vicarious liability in tort did not involve a critical or refined consideration of other concepts in the common law, among which he included the concept of agency. Indeed, he makes the point, I think, that courts should not speak in terms of the authorization of a servant to do something when considering whether the servant's doing of the authorized act rendered the master vicariously liable for something that happened. Now, if Lord Justice Garman is right, then, first of all, he's saying what the House of Lords did in Lloyd and Gray Smith is all wrong. We shouldn't be equating the two. And secondly, he seems to be saying that, well, uh, there's no point in talking about whether an agent or a servant is prohibited from doing something. This is totally irrelevant. I find the whole situation extremely confusing, to say the least, because uh, some of their lordships appear to be talking uh, in different ways at different times. And there appears to be no unanimity in the courts, certainly the English courts, uh, on the question whether uh, you should apply the doctrines of agency to tort as you do to contract, whether you can equate agents and servants, whether you should invoke the notion of prohibition in order to limit or exclude the, li the vicarious liability of the, of the master or principal. Now, if you think that is confusing, it is even more confusing when you look at the discussion that's taken place on the more substantive question, is vicarious liability really vicarious? There are two views. The classical view is that the master or principal is liable because the servant or agent has committed a tort and there was the necessary nexus between the servant or agent on the one hand and the master and principal on the other to render the master or principal vicariously liable. Another view which has been put forward by many writers is that it isn't a question of liability for the tort of the servant or agent. It is liability for the act of the servant or agent. In other words, the liability of the master or principal is direct 
not vicarious. He is liable because he owed some duty to the injured plaintiff. And that duty was broken, not personally by the master or, or a, uh, principal, but by the instrument or tool of the master or principal, namely the servant or agent. So that really, uh, you are treating the servant or agent much as you would treat the stick with which the uh, master or, or principal hit the plaintiff, much the same sort of thing. The only difference being, of course, that uh, in classical terms, you would have an action on the case instead of an action for trespass. But all that, of course, is ancient history and no one worries about it now. Unfortunately, they should, but they don't. Makes things a lot simpler, but anyway. So there, are, there is this other view. Now, a recent case in the Ontario Court of Appeal where these two classical, these two views are clearly set up in opposition to each other is the famous case of the Premium and Scarborough General Hospital where the majority of the Court of Appeal adopt traditional views and say, were the doctors whose negligence was in question the servants or agents of the hospital, or were they independent contractors so as not to render the hospital liable? And that involved the majority um, in a judgment given by Mr. Justice Arnup in discussing all those famous hospital cases and the question of, uh, uh, is the doctor really within the, the scope of the uh, hospital's employment or is he independent and so on. The minority, in particular the judgment of Mr. Justice Blair, approached the problem from a, this different standpoint of saying, never mind about all that. The real issue is, what kind of duty was owed by the hospital to the, the patient? And was that duty breached by someone who was, if you like, uh, within the organization of the hospital. And here is the tie-up between the organization test that I mentioned earlier and the notion that vicarious liability isn't really vicarious at all. Now, the minority, as I say, adopted the view that you are really concerned with the duty of the hospital to the patient, not with the technical questions of agency, service, course of employment, scope of authority, and so on. And certainly, there is a, a kind of uh, symmetry and simplicity about that approach, which uh, enables you, I think, to cut through a lot of verbiage and perhaps avoid solving some, uh, the necessity for solving some rather difficult questions. However, it is only fair and right, I think, to say that there are counter-arguments and there is no general agreement that uh, uh, this approach is one that can be satisfactorily adopted. It would certainly conflict with the precedents, with the classical notions and the case law. It might uh, give rise to uh, some difficulties, which uh, Salmon, I think, uh, suggests, uh, namely the idea that it would resuscitate the notion of liability through command which is long since outdated, uh, and more importantly, the suggestion that the master or principal could always escape liability by saying, well, I acted reasonably in choosing this servant or agent. There was no reason for me to know that he might be negligent. Therefore, I am not guilty of any breach of duty. That, I think, is a possible serious objection to this theory. Uh, the idea that the, the uh, master or principal could say, I fulfilled my duty by acting reasonably in choosing a, a servant or agent. Now, we know that in the context uh, of the employer's common law duty of care to the servant, it is no answer to say, I acted reasonably in choosing fellow employees to work with this employee. In other words, the liability of the employer vis-a-vis -vis his employee to provide a safe system of work is almost, but not quite, a strict liability. In the same way, you could say that in the case of vicarious liability, the employer, the master or principal, should never be able to say, but I acted reasonably in choosing this servant or this agent. I didn't know he was going to turn out to be negligent. You could say he shouldn't be allowed to plead this, which would tend to make his liability pretty strict, and yet, the Privy Council in the Kurangan case say, we don't want strict liability. Vicarious liability is not strict liability. 
It is liability based on fault of some kind. Maybe not yours, the employer's fault, but certainly uh, fault in that you employed him uh, in this capacity and he did the wrong. But it is not strict. Now, if the Privy Council are right there, then maybe you shouldn't uh, apply the approach adopted by Mr. Justice Blair, speaking for the minority in the Premier case, because this might tend, might lead to the interpretation of vicarious liability as strict. Now, it's true that in a sense it is strict, in that it isn't the personal fault of the defendant that is at stake in 99% in of the cases. There may be some cases where he is, but this isn't generally so. It is, in that sense, strict, but it isn't strict in another sense, in that um, he may be able to show that there are reasons why he is not liable even though the servant or agent acted wrongfully. For example, that the servant or agent was acting on a frolic of his own, that the, the servant punched the plaintiff in the eye not because the servant was protecting the master's property, but because the servant didn't like the plaintiff and had a quarrel with him and wanted to hit him. So it isn't that strict. And the question really is, do you want to make it stricter or do you not want to make it stricter? And this uh, is, I think, not so much a question of, of legal theory, although ultimately it would be transformed into legal theory, it is really a question of legal policy. How far do you want employers, to use a neutral term, to be made liable for what those within their employment uh, do? Uh, it's a very important question, but one I don't think that uh, we can answer in the present context. Which leaves me with the last point that I want to raise, where again I think you'll find there are important questions, not so much of legal theory, although there are some of those, but of legal policy. And this is the question of what has sometimes been called vicarious immunity. You have the wrongdoing servant or agent who makes his master or principal liable vicariously, but also renders himself liable uh, because he is, after all, a tortfeasor. Now, there may be circumstances in which, as we've seen, the master or principal is not liable even though the servant or agent is, as, for example, where the servant or agent is acting outside the course of his employment, scope of authority, and so on. Or where the master, for some reason, has some specific immunity, such as, for example, the master is uh, in the diplomatic service, uh, or in the days before the law was changed in England, the master or, or principal was a trade union, uh, and uh, they fell within the ambit of the old Trade Disputes Act of 1906. I don't know what the current situation is. The law changes every time there's a change of government in England, and I'm not au fait with what's been happening recently. But classically, historically, there was that sort of immunity. Or the master or principal might be immune under some clause in a contract, an exemption, exclusion, or limitation, or exculpatory clause of some kind. Now, the question which has arisen very significantly and tendentiously in modern times is what is the effect of any such clause upon the liability of the servant or agent who's the real perpetrator of the harm. The one who might otherwise be vicarious liable li is free from liability to the extent to which the, the clause in question operates for that purpose. But what about the one who actually did the harm? And the struggle has gone on in the courts over the extension of the application of these clauses. Now, clearly, you can only have possible application where the clause itself refers to the tort-feasant party, uh, the famous Himalaya-type clause, which pur purports to protect not only the contracting party, in that case, um, the P&O Steamship Company, but also the servants and agents and independent contractors of the contracting party. Now, as we know, uh, the initial attitude of the courts was to say that the negligent servant or agent or independent contractor, for that matter, could not avail himself of the exemption clause. Uh, it was res inter alias acta. He wasn't privy. Uh, it's nothing to do with him. And this culminated in the decision of the House of Lords in uh, Scruttons and Midland Silicones, which was adopted by the Supreme Court of Canada in the Canadian General Electric case, Canadian General Electric and Pickford and Black in about 19... 70-something, I've forgotten what. However, 
In the New Zealand shipping case, New Zealand shipping company of Satterthwaite, sometimes called the Urimidan, in 1975, the Privy Council found a way out. They found a way out in the language of Lord Reed in the Scruton's case by saying that if the contracting party, the employer, contracted with respect to the exemption clause as the, as the agent, sorry, as the agent of his servant or agent, in applying the normal principles of agency, then the servant or agent was a party to the contract, at least as regards the exemption clause, could rely on it and could be immune or escape to some extent from liability. But you had to have the necessary agency relationship and the necessary contractual uh, ingredients, such as consideration and offer and acceptance on. And this was found in the Eurimidon on the fact of that case. Uh, the stevedores were held to be the principles of the shipping company um, so far as the exemption clause was concerned. And there was consideration for the whole contract in that they provided the work. It was found also in uh, an Australian case, the uh, Port Jackson Stephen Doran Company in uh, Spragans and Salmon and Spragans. Um, and it is clear that if you can find this necessary agency relationship, you can allow the negligent servant or agent to gain exemption from liability. The problem is that what you're saying for these purposes is that the agent or servant of the principal becomes the principal of the principal, or if you like, that the principal becomes the agent of his agent. I think the whole thing is a fiction designed for the purpose of enabling the courts to extend the scope of these exemption clauses, which is surprising in view of the fact that they have said more than once they don't like exemption clauses and they won't uh, operate them uh, and apply them unless it is clear on a very strict construction that it must operate on the particular circumstances. You think of all the um, dodges that the courts have got up to in recent years, culminating uh, in that uh, decision of the Supreme Court of Canada in the Beaufort Realties case, um, the, the Chomedy Aluminium case, whatever it's called, um, to try and get around the application of an exemption clause which clearly applies. And yet here they are saying, oh no, we're going to let the exemption clause apply. Now it's instructive, I think, to compare two recent Canadian cases in this regard, in one of which the argument failed and in the other which it succeeded. The argument failed in a decision of the Supreme Court of Canada in Greenwood Plaza Shopping, shop, Greenwood Shopping Plaza and Beatty. And there, the employees attempted to invoke a, a clause in a lease to which their employers were party, in, in which the, um, the landlord had said that he would not uh, invoke subrogation rights against the, any negligent employees, any wrongful employees, if a fire had destroyed the property. Now, these employees were negligent. It was their fire that destroyed the property. And when they were sued by the landlord, they said, but you promised not to do this. Uh, to which the answer was, I promised the lessee I wouldn't do it. I didn't promise you chaps. You're not parties to the transaction. So their argument was, well, we must be parties to the transaction because it was our employer who made the lease. And he obviously made it on our behalf. And the, in the Nova Scotia Court of Appeal, Chief Justice uh, McKeegan, I think, had a very fascinating judgment in which uh, he often has fascinating judgments. There's a wonderful one of his in a case called Reed Spears and Levy, which is all about marriage and uh, unjust enrichment and is quite the most remarkable piece of legal writing I've read in many years. Anyway, in this case, he, uh, he propounded the view that, it, and in this he relied upon some dicta of Lord Wilberforce in the uh, Eurimidon case, as some other Canadian judges have done in the federal court and elsewhere in recent years, to, su to, to suggest that what you're looking at is the real purpose behind the transaction. Never mind what the parties actually wrote, what is the ultimate purpose of the transaction? I am paraphrasing what he said, of course. And uh, here, the obvious intent was that the parties, the landlord, really intended to not to hold anybody responsible, simply to collect on the insurance. And therefore, these uh, negligent employees should be entitled to the exemption. But in the Supreme Court of Canada, uh, Mr. Justice McIntyre, speaking of the court, took a very technical view and said, 
But law is this. If you're not a party, you cannot claim an exemption. You become a party either by the doctrine of agency or by the doctrine of trust, which is another story that needn't worry us. Trust wasn't operative here. Agency wasn't either because the lessee did not contract as an agent for his employees, and there was no consideration given by the employees to the landlord for any promise to exempt them from liability. Now, in the Dyke case, a Manitoba case, Dyke and the Manitoba Snowmobile Association, the very opposite decision was reached. And this is a case where the plaintiff sued in respect of the alleged negligence of the starter of the association at the beginning of a race, resulting in his injury. In the um, contract, which was, in fact, the entry in, into the race, there was specific provision which said that the organizers of the race and their employees, etc., would not be liable are exempt from liability. Again, I'm not giving you the exact words, but the gist of it. Now, the starter, who was certainly an employee of the association, claimed the benefit of that exemption clause. And here, the Manitoba Court of Appeal said he was entitled to it, because here, the obvious intention was to contract with this, for this exemption clause on his behalf and all the other people's behalf. And secondly, he provided consideration. What was the consideration? That he fired the gun that started the race? They don't say that. I can only assume that that's what they had in mind. Now, in the Eurimedon, there may have been consideration because the, uh, the stevedores did unload the goods. And though they did something for the owner of the goods, and therefore might, uh, they, they could be argued, they would only do this if they were given the promise or benefit of the exemption clause. But would the starter not have started if there hadn't been the exemption clause? I don't know. Uh, the Manitoba Court of Appeal do not really analyze the situation very carefully. They simply say the ingredients for this kind of extension are the ones that you cull from uh, Lord Reed's judgment in, uh, in Scruttons and from the judgment of the Supreme Court in the Greenwood Plaza case. And uh, there is enough evidence here to establish the necessary ingredients, and therefore you can apply it. Now, once again, I say the law is in a state of confusion. Uh, I don't think that they have yet resolved what they want to do or why they want to do it. Uh, and um, it, sooner or later, it must be resolved. Yeah. The issue, I think, is whether you want to extend the scope of these exemption clauses to protect the negligent or wrongful servant or agent, or whether uh, you, you feel that uh, everybody should contract for his own particular exemption uh, if he wants it. Now, this is a matter of policy rather than of legal theory. But in the meantime, there's also been, I think, a little confusion of the legal theory. I do not like the application of the doctrine of agency in this context, in this way. I think it is uh, suspect, it is fictitious, it is objectionable as a purist. It may have very great practical utility, but um, that's another matter, and, and uh, I think it offends my uh, innate sense of legal purism. You know, no doubt something which will uh, not uh, meet with the approval of my colleagues, uh, Dean McCamus and Mr. Maddow. However, uh, I can see reasons for wanting to extend the scope of these clauses. Uh, but if you want to do it, I think it should be done uh, more appropriately than by these uh, roundabout ways, uh, which I think uh, lead uh, to the disrepute of the law. Well, I think I've suggested enough, and there's much more in the paper when it comes out, to indicate that there is uh, considerable confusion and flexibility and uh, uh, argument about the modern law of vicarious liability. There are a number of issues which will have to be resolved in the coming years. Uh, fortunately, it is not for me to resolve them, but rather for you in the practical world of the law.